Um, a few things about me, where I am. Uh, I've been doing this kind of thing for uh, nearly 30 years now, since 1994. Uh, I started as a developer, and then um, relatively soon after, pretty young, I was doing uh, the role of an enterprise architect in my, uh, my mid-20s. Um, then I, um, I joined John Smart's team. Um, I was in Barclays. Uh, I've been in Barclays for about 10 years, and then I, I, I was super lucky to join John Smart's team, team as an agile transformation lead. Uh, but then we decided that uh, it wasn't an agile transformation we were doing. It was agile adoption. And then uh, we decided actually it was ways of working. It wasn't just agile at all. Uh, that was fun. Um, then uh, in... 2019, uh, I decided to do a Brexit escape from the UK. Uh, I'm now a Brexit refugee. I live in Copenhagen. I work for Saxo Bank. Um, and there I combine my two passions of ways of working and technology architecture. Uh, uh, I was also really uh, lucky to be asked to write a chapter in John Smart's book, Sooner, Safer, Happier. Um, yeah, uh, really humbled to do that. So, uh, we're talking about modern enterprise architecture, and uh, well, that's architecture in a modern enterprise. So, the, the characteristics uh, here of the modern enterprise I'm going to talk about are that, well, it's fairly large, it's an enterprise, it's uh, a team of, team of teams, typically greater than 150 people. That's uh, the Dunbar number, for those who recognize it. Um, the, typically, your enterprise interacts with customers digitally. Change is a constant. Uh, it's a heterogeneous environment, so there are old systems and new ones, there's large ones and small ones, pace of change is slow and fast, there are some monoliths, there are some distributed systems and some vendor systems and some internal systems. Um, and tech-wise, it's not just one system, it's a system of systems, or more typically, it's a system of system of systems at that scale. And... Uh, if you're going to do architecture at that scale, modern enterprise architecture, I've got um, uh, I've got five things: A, B, C, D, E. That an enterprise architecture, an enterprise architect should be practicing. Uh, a, uh, alignment. Uh, Diana said yesterday uh, the alignment was linear. Um, I love this conference. I agree with 99% of the things I hear at this conference, and actually. I like this conference because I disagree with 1% of the things as well, and it's respectful disagreement. I don't think alignment is necessarily linear, and I'll talk a little bit about why I think that is. Um, so this is about Conway's law and the reverse Conway maneuver and a systems approach to that. Uh, re removing complexity and increasing autonomy in enterprise architecture, a bit as politics and diplomacy. B is for better value, sooner, safer, happier. It is architecting for outcomes. Those are the outcomes. I'll talk about that. This is where the book title comes from. C is for continuous architecture. Enterprise architecture is often about governance. Um, and old traditional enterprise architecture has governed on a sort of occasional basis with things like architecture review boards that they don't work anymore. I'll talk about why. So we talk about a stream of continuous architecture decisions. There was a Vaughan Vernon post on LinkedIn about that last week. Uh, it's moving decisions down into the right level of the organization. I know I was just talking about that as well. And it's some automation of policies as well. Uh, architecture as DevOps at enterprise scale as well. The feedback loop, uh, the graphic there is so important. Learning by observing everything is continuous. And, and we have to be humble. Uh, as architects as well. We have to be humble as software developers. We have to be humble and agile. Uh, finally, uh, a bit about evolution. Last year, we had both Paco and Rebecca Parsons, two of the four co-authors of Evolutionary Architecture. Uh, such an awesome book. Uh, and this is taking some of their practices and bringing them up to enterprise scale as well. So talking about fitness functions, not just uh, at a lowest system level, but talking about some of the fitness functions that might be appropriate at system of system, a system of system of systems level. Uh, and as well as that, two paces of evolution, fast and slow. Um, a little sidebar before we start, some growth and fixed definitions. Jim Highsmith posted on LinkedIn last week his new book, Wild West to Agile, for those who haven't read it yet, by the way, is Awesome. Agile, some fixed definitions of Agile. Um, 
fixed mindset frameworks, certifications, coaches, processes and tools, sprints, stand-ups, Scrum, just Scrum. It's not what Agile is about. Uh, as you guys know who've read the manifesto, it's about uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. It's about individuals and interactions over processes and tools and early and continuous delivery of, of, of valuable software. Value is still super important and continuous attention to technical excellence and good design. DevOps as well, I'll talk a bit more about DevOps, but DevOps has shrunk into this tiny thing. There's a DevOps department and DevOps is about Kubernetes or CI, CD. Uh, the growth mindset is, no, DevOps is about you build it, you run it, you deploy it, it's about autonomy. Culture, calms, culture automation, lean metrics and sharing. And Gene Kim's three ways, systems thinking is incredibly important in DevOps, as well as the concept that actually business is dev and, and you're operating for the customer. So, uh, where are we? Start with, well, I'm not going to start with why, I'm going to start with where and how did we get here. Like I said, my career started in the 90s. I uh, finished my master's degree in 94 and then started work in 94. Um, the first commercial web browser, Netscape Navigator, came out um, and the chaos, the standard chaos report about 23% uh, in 1994, 23% of software projects being uh, considered successes. Uh, 95 was the first paper on Scrum, based on the much earlier new new devel product development game. 99, uh, I had one of these. I am that old. This was the first uh, web-enabled phone, the Nokia 7110. Uh, and uh, my favorite book um, in the uh, Agile world, Extreme Programming Explained. Uh, I did get that original first edition back in 99. All about embracing change, as I know I just mentioned. Um, and software ate the world. Um, this was Mark Andreessen's idea. I don't agree 100% with um, all of what Mark Andreessen was saying, that software would take over healthcare, and uh, it's not healthcare still about healthcare. It's not about software. But uh, everything became software. Everything became consumer software because the Nokia 7110 eventually evolved into the iPhone and Android, the thing that, the black mirror that everybody has in their hand all the time. Uh, and a paradigm shift happened in software development. The thing that, uh, the way that things had happened in the 90s and the 80s, this uh, long cycles of planning and then code and then test and then release and then operate, uh, a whole bunch of things happened to disrupt that. Agile was one of them, systems thinking, DevOps. Uh, and now we do things much quicker. And instead of software delivery taking months, it can take days or hours, uh, or even in the words of Dan North's book, Software Faster, from months to minutes. Um, and hopefully, ideally, we center that on one team instead of a bunch of siloed teams. But not everybody noticed this. Uh, there are still enterprises who are, even today, um, and my colleagues in Sunosef are happy I've been consulting with them, are transforming their organizations still into plan departments, build departments, test departments, and run departments. Not everybody noticed that that's not the way to do things. And uh, complexity in the existing landscape started to dominate the pace of change. I'm going to talk a lot about complexity. Uh, Diana yesterday reminded me to put a key on the picture here. This comes from uh, a guy called Roger Sessions who wrote a lot in the 90s and noughties uh, about complexity and how to reduce it and how to manage it. Roger Sessions, uh, it seems, has now retired from software architecture and runs a meditation practice in Mexico. Maybe that's something to learn for all of us. Um, but. This is a typical enterprise landscape, uh, a, a sort of distributed big ball of mud, effectively. Um, and Roger Sessions and many others have written patterns to manage complexity. Uh, back in 2008, he uh, wrote a book called Simple Architectures for Complex Enterprises and talked about autonomous business capabilities. He'd previously called these weird terms like fortress and snowman architecture, but I prefer his last one, autonomous business capability, and a, a whole bunch of uh, 
practices and principles for that. Mainly, of course, keep it simple. Uh, the problems we have today are similar, but not the same as those in the 90s. In the 90s, the problem that I could think Agile was trying to solve was that civil engineering processes were seen as the best way to deliver any software change. Again, Dan North talks a lot about this. And we learned that wasn't necessarily the case. But in the 20s, one of the main problems certainly I see in the enterprises I've worked in and the enterprises I talk to are that the software landscape is so complex that whilst it might be a, a nice idea to have single autonomous teams, uh, having a single feature typically requ requires two, three, four, or five, 12 teams to implement. And so we have to fall back on these project management or at least coordination techniques. Maybe they're project management techniques, maybe it's waterfall, maybe it's safe, which, as you know, is not really our job. Uh, where does enterprise architecture come in? Uh, well, a fixed mindset says tell the organization what to do here. Um, that's not what I'm going to talk about. For me, enterprise architecture and how I practice it, it's helping the organization. This is a complex thing, and I'll, I'll obviously drill into it a lot. Helping the organization view itself as a complex socio-technical system of systems of systems and help to reduce that complexity over time based on outcomes and learning. A. Alignment. Again, I don't think uh, I don't think this is linear. I think this is, I'll, I'll talk about it. So Conway's law, we've heard a lot about today, very, very roughly, and I'll go into the less rough version, that organization architecture drives system architecture. Uh, Ruth Malan, who we'll hear from a lot, phrases this as, if the architecture of the system and the architecture of the organization are at odds, then the architecture of the organization wins. But, uh, another awesome observation from Thierry de Pau. Later, where all hell breaks loose is if you've got a system and an organization and management decides to reorganize for one reason or another, you try to change the organization and the software won't let it happen. Well, um, there's a quote from Winston Churchill after the Houses of Parliament in the UK was bombed during the Second World War. Uh, he was asked whether he wanted to redesign the UK Houses of Parliament as something that was more consensus-driven, uh, a sort of round arrangement like many of the European parliaments. He said, no, I want to keep it as opposition and opposition because uh, that's how I see UK politics. He said, we shape our buildings thereafter they shape us. Gene Kim has taken and shifted this quote and says, we shape our architectures and thereafter they shape us. Of course, this is a feedback loop. Organization structure drives architecture initially, but we've got an architecture, we've got systems architecture there, and that constrains the organization as well. And it's a constraint loop. Ruth Mallon again says, system architects, who we call architects, and business organization architects, who we call managers, should not work as if one has no impact on the other. If the managers are trying to change the organization structure and the architects are trying to change the system architect architecture, and they're not talking, then you are going to have a problem. Gregor Hopi has written a lot about enterprise architecture. I love his stuff about the architect elevator. A uh, great presentation he did a couple of years ago saying enterprise architecture is the glue between business architecture and IT architecture. Awesome. And uh, very recently, we've had a lot of uh, trends in business agility of our managers or organization architects trying to reorganize around value streams. Now, that in itself is, is, a, is a pretty decent thing, but it's not if it's done in the absence of thinking about the systems architecture. So we've got to think about how all of these things affect each other. The value streams, the value architecture, the team structure, the organization architecture, and the system architecture. And this, for me, is the enterprise architecture. It's all three of those things. It is value, organization, and technology and processes working together. Uh, and for sustainable flow, for sustainable flow of value, which we've been talking about all conference, You've got to align all three. Team topologies, again, we've talked 
a lot about. So at that lowest level of the organization, a two pizza sized team, a stream alliance team. Value, some OKRs, maybe OKRs are good. Uh, KPI, KPI is to see what your business is right now and OKRs to look forward. A two pizza team, less than roughly 20 is an interesting number. Uh, the reason I picked 20 is um, Johanna Rothman wrote a super interesting article a couple of days ago saying, look, typically we advise teams to be around 12 people because the communication is too hard after that. But actually, if you limit work in progress enough, you can stretch the size of a single lowest level team to about 20. But a two pizza team, Martin Fowler says, look, two pizzas are the American pizzas. They feed actually a fair few people, 20s maybe towards the limits there. And again, uh, team topologies quoting Dan North, software that fits inside the team's head. That's the cognitive load stuff. It's a, a domain-driven design boundary. It's eventually consistent. Um, Roger Sessions talked earlier, one of the things um, that uh, these uh, teams and the autonomous business capability should do is be asynchronous by default. That protects them. Independently deployable and testable, that's what Sam Newman says uh, about uh, microservices being the, the first DevOps native architecture. Monolith versus microservices is missing the point, though. It's not necessarily a microservice, it's just something the team owns. Emergent design and evolutionary architecture. We'll talk about evolutionary before. Great, awesome. This is the stuff that I know I was talking about before. Cool. So uh, the team owns an autonomous business capability. The architecture is inside the system. The size of the system is just about enough so that they can communicate. Who needs an architect? What's the architect for this team? Well, Martin Fowler wrote about this 20 years ago. Um, somebody tweeted the other day, uh, I want to do a talk on Martin Fowler talked about all of this 20 years ago. It is true. Two Martin Fowler articles which basically say who needs an architect um, uh, and what the role of an architect is. And his answer is, well, architecture isn't dead, but the matrix style architect sitting outside the team should be. Uh, he says the architect really in, a, in an XP team, in a two pizza sized team, is the coach. They're coaching, they're enabling the team to own and make the architectural decisions themselves. They're taking their expertise and spreading it and teaching. So there isn't an architect in that form sitting outside the team in that two pizza team with an autonomous business capability. That's awesome, it's great, but no system is an island, no team is an island. Um, balancing coupling, we've referred to um, the talk yesterday, uh, at least I've seen one reference to it here. No system is an island. You can loosely couple, but you can't decouple entirely. You have systems of systems, and systems and sy of systems of systems. So you have a team of teams. That team of teams is also driving value for the organization. Uh, hopefully that team of teams is below the Dunbar number. They can have a decent sort of uh, conversation and relationship between all of those teams. And the system of system of systems that fits inside, well, that team of teams head. There is nested DDD. Domain boundaries in DDD are not at a single level. Eric Evans talks a lot about nested and overlapping boundaries and shared data models. Again, some eventually consistent. The components should be independently deployable and testable, should be, for most circumstances. Sometimes you're going to need to test bigger for some features that cross multiple boundaries. You are going to have to test across multiple systems. Again, no system is an island. No team is an island. But your typical organization is probably bigger than that. Uh, Eduardo talked about this yesterday, about teams and product lines and product groups. That's the nesting for some. Organizations, for, for me, working for Saxo Bank, we have one product. It's a, it's a trading system, but it's really complex, and it takes about, about 1,000 technologists to run the various components of that system. But there is still a set of North Star goals and OKRs that we have as an organization. They decompose to individual teams. Are they self-organizing? Um, does the system of system of systems fit in anyone's head? 
Interesting question. Uh, back to Conway. Conway, of course, says uh, a little more nuance. He says, designs, uh, sorry, design systems are constraints to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of the organizations. But he also says the best design which occurs first is almost never the best possible. The prevailing system concept may need to change. Flexibility of the organization is important to effective design. And ways must be found to re reward design managers for keeping their organizations lean and flexible. So self-organizing teams, yes, at the lowest level. 100% self-organizing. Team of team of teams, maybe not. I think this is where enterprise architecture really helps. B, for better value, sooner, safer, and happier. Traditional enterprise archi and, uh, architecture outcomes of standardization, consistency, predictive planning, cost reduction, they're not outcomes. They don't align with what the business really wants. And certainly outcomes of cloud, Kubernetes, and microservices, these aren't business outcomes at all. What we talk about uh, in sooner, safer, happier are, uh, are Five outcomes. Value. Value is special. Value is what makes your organization your organization. But just delivering value needs to be balanced with quality. That's better. Flow, sustainably uh, improving flow. Safety. Most organizations need at least to be secure. Often, most often, you'll need to deal with data privacy, things like GDPR, minimum viable compliance, but also Happiness. Happiness is really important for your customers, for your colleagues, for citizens, and for climate as well. We talked about green technology yesterday. Back to Gene. Uh, we shape our architectures, thereafter they shape us. And as the systems we build become larger, the coordination increases. It can grow so large that all our time is spent coordinating and not creating value. Uh, an example here of some teams, some teams that exist already. This isn't exactly teams in an organization, but it's very similar to some teams I have seen. An idea from the business. Hey, we want to implement a function called Hello World. Uh, and we got five teams. Great, those five teams exist already. The UI team, the API layer team, the greeting service team, the planet service team, and the DBAs. So to implement Hello World, we need some solution architects. Because th those teams aren't going to, they're not going to do it themselves. So uh, the hello feature or sub feature or user story goes to the greeting service team. The world user story goes to the planet service team. The API team needs to build a thing too. And the UI needs to wrap it with some quotes and add a little exclamation mark. And then the DBI, DBA team need to store something in a T underscore HW because that's their naming convention for tables. Um, something that looks a little bit like Hello World comes out Hello World. It's, it's, it's close enough. Um, the, the testing team are under pressure, so they're going to sign that off. Um, and great, eventually, after a few months, uh, that's going to deliver some value to some customer somewhere. Cool. Um, so empowering those teams is probably not enough. What we've got to do is effectively work together to say what's more efficient, what is more efficient socio-technically. We really need to refactor both the organization and the architecture together to say, hey, it actually makes much more sense to have one team there, what Martin Fowler calls the full burrito. You own the full stack, you own the full life cycle, everything from front end to data. And then, cool. Um, Scott Prue. Uh, at the DevOps Enterprise Summit, he's done a few talks on this. It's awesome. Uh, how do you how do you convince your business that it's a good idea to do that architecture refactoring and that organization refactoring? Well, actually, it's costs and risks. Uh, he says look, the 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 chances of you delivering and the costs of delivering, and he does the accounting here. If you've got fewer teams and less coordination to do, the chances of you delivering are so much higher. The costs are so much lower. It may seem like common sense, but you can actually run the numbers on it. C, uh, continuous governance, conversational 
and automated. Uh, back to complexity. Um, creating and reducing complexity, it might seem that actually if you uh, create a bit too much complexity in the organization, then it, you, it's fine, you can reverse it. It's not, there's an asymmetry. You put complexity in, taking it out costs you a lot more than avoiding it in the first place. And for me, this is what modern enterprise architecture governance is about. It's trying to avoid creating too much complexity in the first place. Traditional architecture governance though, it's an anti-pattern architecture review boards are traditionally how enterprise architecture has worked and governed. Um, and you've got something that's waterfall or wadjal or hybrid or water scrumfall. You've got an initiate phase and a plan phase and execute and a close that are mirrored with software, uh, activities of analysis, and design, build and test and release. And that's cool, because an architecture board can fit in there at the end of analysis, and then at the end of design, they review some stuff and give it a rubber stamp and say, yes, that's awesome. But we're not there now. Um, an Agile or a Lean project has a tiny initiation phase. We plan and execute in parallel, uh, and eventually we close. We do lots of analysis. We start a tiny bit early, a little bit ahead of test, design, and build in a loop, and we keep releasing often and early. So, well, great. The architecture board might be able to review something there, but we haven't really made any uh, important decisions yet because we're going to do those as we work. So where does the architecture board sit there? They don't. They can't. And then if we move from project to product, where the hell does the architecture board sit there? Again, that. They simply can't. It's, it's not just an anti-pattern. It just it doesn't fit. It's a square peg in a round hole. So instead, what we look for is continuous governance. Uh, black box, for example, which means you don't get designs on paper to rubber stamp anymore. It's the thing that is actually realized in the system. So how, how do we work? How do I work? How do I govern um, and try and avoid complexity? Well. Adding a new service to the landscape, even that, that is adding complexity. Often it is needed, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes you can do things in a different way. So we, in, in, in my team, we approve new services. Uh, I think my service needs to get some data from another service for one reason or another. Uh, cool, again, but that's adding complexity. Any connection no matter how loosely coupled, is, is adding complexity. It might be right, but let's have a conversation about it. And we approve that because we have zero trust security, so we're able to actually say, yeah, no, um, do, do things a different way. You have that data in, in, in one form, just use it as it is. Um, and again, we encourage um, teams to be asynchronous by default, but some connections between services. If you're looking for something deep in a historic data set, you're not going to get that published on Kafka. So we want an exception. Great. We will give you exceptions. We'll do it conversationally. We'll do it quickly. We'll do it in minutes. And that's uh, at least where we're getting towards is, is that all of those are pull requests. So enterprise architects as, uh, as, as effectively as GitOps. And uh, overlapping conversation. Um, I forget who it was yesterday. I think it was Michael was talking about uh, an architecture forum. Uh, that's what we promote as well. So the enterprise architecture team is tiny. The architecture expertise is spread out through the organization. We do have a forum of the more senior developers who start to talk to other developers about uh, architecture decisions, that stream of architecture decisions. So the, the, um, the conversation happens with peers. That can happen in an agile project or even in your, uh, in your product mode. Uh, it can happen across value streams as well as within them. So again, we've got the community of practice supported by a tiny center of excellence, an enabling team of, of enterprise architects, of people who are looking at system of system of systems level. Which takes us on to D, uh, practicing DevOps at enterprise scale. Uh, that continuous conversational governance is effectively, it's going around the loop and learning at a high level scope. 
at the highest level scope and over a longer term time frame. So the incentives of the, of the teams there to deliver features. Uh, the incentive of the Architecture Center of Excellence is to help teams deliver features, but to promote that sustainability and to promote that sustainability across systems and across systems of systems of systems. Sometimes there are trade-offs. Sometimes delivering features quickly means there need to be compromises in the longer term uh, and vice versa, uh, and we talk about it. Uh, as well as a stakeholder here that uh, an anti-pattern in organizations I have seen is that architects and, and people who are actually managing your services, people who are running ITIL processes, don't talk to each other. Actually, it's a symbiotic relationship. Again, dev plus ops. The service management people run something like a config management database. That is an architecture, uh, a set of architecture artifacts as much as it is a service management set of artifacts. Back to Ruth Malan again, the feedback loop. Uh, visualizing architecture. Ruth talks about intention and reflection. Um, you intend to do something, you visualize it, you draw it up beforehand just to support those conversations. But then that gets deployed as a running system. And you reflect on what gets deployed because that was never exactly what you intended. Production systems tend to not necessarily look like the diagrams. What they actually look like, though, these days can be observed. Observability tooling, again, is an incredible help for enterprise architects, for modern enterprise architects. What the hell is going on in that system? It doesn't necessarily look like that boxes and lines diagram, but I can drill into it. Tools like Dynatrace, Elastic, Prometheus, Grafana. I'm using these almost daily. Uh, finally, E. Uh, curating the evolution of enterprise architecture and organization. As I said before, um, having Rebecca and Patrick here last time, it was awesome to hear from them about building evolutionary architectures. There's also a fantastic ThoughtWorks podcast where they talk about it as well. Really recommend that. One of the things they talk about is how hard it is once you're at distributed system level. Uh, there's a talk uh, yesterday was it yesterday or today? I know it's on the um, it is on the agenda about using things like uh, J molecules and Arch unit within systems, uh, within individual systems to start to look at some of these numbers. But once you get to distributed systems, and again Neil talks about it on the podcast, it's really hard. But there are some numbers. Um, there are some fitness functions. The number of two pizza teams required to implement a typical business feature, if that number is high, then you've got too little cohesion and way too much coupling. To monitor that number, that might involve talking to your portfolio management teams, but that's definitely a fitness function at enterprise level. Uh, again, asynchronous connections versus synchronous connections. Um, in Neil Ford's other book, I'm sorry that I forget the co-author, Architecture, The Hard Parts, effectively says a, a quantum of architecture. If you are synchronously calling another system, it's effectively one system. It's in a single architecture quantum. You need to decouple by, uh, by having asynchronous connections between the systems. So another good fitness function there is, is the number of asynchronous connections over the number of synchronous connections. Try and use that for enterprise architecture, evolutionary fitness. There's another thing we talk about in Sooner, Safer, Happier. Um, in biological evolution, there were two competing theories. The theory of gradual evolution, that there were sort of continuous changes over time, and then a second one called punctuated equilibria that said there were no changes for long, long periods of time, for millennia. And then something happened uh, to cause a big change. And in biological theory, those two were reconciled with something called punctuated gradualism. Uh, and for me, this is how enterprise architecture goes as well, how it evolves. That you need to pay continuous attention to complexity, pay down complexity debt, and do continuous improvement. That needs continuous funding. But also, occasionally, you are going to need to have a step change. 
to refactor teams, to refactor systems, and make a business case that actually this is just it's, it's too old, it's too complicated, it's too coupled. Of course, again, back to Martin Fowler, uh, the strangler fig pattern is really the best way to do this. It's one of the only ways. You, you need to take parts of the system out and replace them piece by piece. Uh, for us, in Saxo Bank, we're doing this slowly. I, I loved the BOL story from Eduardo yesterday that said, look, this, is, this has taken 20 years to get us where we are so far, and it's continuing. I've been at Saxo Bank for five years so far, and we, we've done some. We have done some of the evolution into autonomous business capabilities um, and teams. Um, there's plenty of the distributed big ball of mud still standing, but we are evolving. So, to recap again, modern enterprise architecture, A, B, C, D, E, uh, its alignment, um, but in that continuous uh, feedback learning way, it's better value, sooner, safer, and happier. It's continuous governance that's conversational and automated. It's DevOps at enterprise scale, and it's curating that evolution of the enterprise architecture and the organization. Thank you. I think I have five minutes for questions. I think I timed that OK. Yes, and we got some. Cool. So first of all, thanks again from me. And uh, yeah, we just start with the questions. Where and how do you start to break the constraint loop of architecture and organization? Uh, that was, and what I said was, enterprise architecture is politics and diplomacy. It is hard. Managers are often incentivized to keep the, um, uh, the power structures that they have. If you have uh, a manager uh, who has an API layer department, uh, then saying, actually, we shouldn't have an API layer department. There should be uh, departments aligned to business functions. That's, it, it, it's hard. Uh, you do it by uh, pol polishing your influencing skills, by working up to the right layer of the organization. That might even be all the way up to the executive team and, and just saying, look, we don't want to disrupt this quickly but here are some ways that where the organization might be a little bit more efficient. And it, again, it's going to take time. Okay. The next one. What should not be governed to allow team local decisions? Uh, for instance, a new service just used as a component within the team boundary? Yeah, exactly that. Within the team boundary, uh, effectively anything goes. Uh, I say that, and I'm more than happy to put the little asterisk on that and then have a long conversation about what the asterisk means. But r roughly within the team boundary, anything goes. Okay, and another one. What if uh, we may, what if we have many Hello World features that are created but not iterated on? Um, okay, sorry, it's not, now somebody voted it down. Uh, so we won't have a dedicated team and uh, it becomes unowned. So read it again. Um, can I take that one offline? Because I saw, I think I get it, but it would be better if you just grab me for that. Okay, that's a grab please. Me. Then maybe, do you have hints to start enterprise architecture as GitOps? <laughs> yes, I do. Um, You've got to be using cloud class technologies. Uh, you've really got to be um, using uh, or moving towards zero trust security. Um, you have to have some boundaries around, again, who can create a new thing, a new namespace, a new service in your CMDB. Um, again, I, I can talk a lot more about this person to person, but yes, there are, there are certain things that you just have, have to have under automated control in order to be able to do that. All right, and the last one. How do you support the community of practices and enabling team of architecture to not become review boards? And additionally, how do you align incentives? Sorry, to not become... Review boards. So, how do you make sure that those? Oh, to not become review boards. Re oh, interesting. Um, 
Well, to a degree, like I said, uh, the review boards can't happen. But uh, what I have seen in my previous organization was that people just tried to make them happen. Anyway, they tried to cargo cult them and say, well, you, you need to come to us. You've got to come to us. Again, it's hard. It's the politics and the diplomacy and just saying, look, guys, the world has changed. It's that paradigm shift. Um, design is continuous and decisions are shifted to the lowest level. Again, it, it just it takes time and conviction. There was a really interesting conversation yesterday about sort of, um, and we didn't have this in the UK, we do a little in Denmark, I know we do for our office in Amsterdam, the, the workers' councils will basically say, look, you've changed the role of a, of a person. This is really bad. Uh, you, have, you, you can't do that. Well, the paradigm shift means you have to. So you've, you've got to do it slowly and with care and taking people's fears into account as well and take them through that transition. But it really is. It's, it's a shift change. Uh, it's, it's a transition. We got one in, <laughs> if that's okay for you. Um, but that's the really last question then. <laughs> when you coach a team, how deep do you go into tech? Uh, I go really deep. Uh, this is this goes back to um, it goes back to Gregor Hopi's view of the architect elevator. He says an architecture function, not necessarily a single architect, but an architecture function should be able to go from the penthouse to the engine room. That's all the way from standing in front of the executive team and the CEO, uh, selling your architecture, all the way down to individual lines of code. We as architects, and per personally me, I do I do all of that. I I do. I will speak to our CEO one meeting, and then half an hour later, I will be helping a junior developer with code. Maybe not every enterprise architect needs to do that, but I certainly think every enterprise architecture function needs to be able to do that to be plausible. Yeah, I'm, I'm always thinking whether Gregor was inspired by IT crowd. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly the same picture there. But yeah, it, thanks a lot. Thank you. See you. Much.